Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Engineering SADX lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. So two special cases that you'll see all the time are wheels and wedges. Wheels and wedges. Wedges aren't too bad, but wheels is where it becomes a mess. This is where everyone starts to hate friction. So again, there's special shapes which follow specific frictional rules. The first one is wheels, which again is the worst one. Because remember, when we did that free body diagram, we said, okay, if our force is going to the right, then our frictional force is going to the left. Well, sometimes it's not that easy to see which way our frictional force actually goes. So for wheels, the direction of friction depends on if the wheel is subjected to a force or a moment. So you'll see two different scenarios. And of course, the frictional force changes depending on what scenario you get. So this is the first one that tricks almost every student, unfortunately. So let's look at the case of an applied force. If I were to take a wheel and I were to just pull along its axle, we know that, of course, our frictional force is going to go opposite. Let's pretend that this wasn't a wheel. Let's just pretend that this was a box. Well, this is the same scenario. If I'm pulling to the left, well, my frictional force must go to the right. Now, for all purposes, I also included the normal force because I know there's going to be some troll in the comments saying, Clayton, you forgot the normal force. Well, no, don't worry, it's here. But again, all we're concerned with in this slide is the direction of the frictional force. Now, here's where the fun comes in. If I were to look, and I'm going to take my mouse and I'm going to put it on screen, so here's my mouse here. If we were to look at the very bottom of this wheel, and I have a force pushing it kind of to the right here, we know that our wheel is going to start rotating counterclockwise, like this. Makes sense, right? If I were to pull a car or tow a car, we know that the wheels are going to start turning and it's going to have that nice motion. So again, the key here is that the blue thing is our applied force or moment and the dash line, the red dash line, that's our direction of motion. So you guys are looking at this and saying, Clayton, I thought you said it was hard. Come on, bro. This is as simple as it gets. Well, this is where it starts getting tricky. And again, this is where it trick everyone. This was an applied force. What about an applied moment? So if you guys think about actual automobiles, cars, whatever, we don't pull them. Of course, when they break down, you have to tow them, but we don't pull them. What happens is the axle turns and what actually happens to these wheels is they have a moment. They have a moment. Now here's where the fun begins. I'm gonna bring my mouse on screen. So if we know that this is rotating counterclockwise and we were to look at the bottom right here, we know that the frictional force wants to resist this motion. So if I were to look at the very bottom, it is going to the right. So we know that in this case, our frictional force is actually going to the left, to the left. Isn't that crazy? This is where friction becomes so mean. It's going to the left. And of course I drew in my normal force. Now you're saying Clayton, why is it going to the left? Well, let's think about this. If we were to do summation of forces in the x direction horizontal right now, we can see that our only force is our frictional force. So if I want to create movement, we actually need that frictional force. Think about this. You guys ever go to the McDonald's parking lot after high school and all those skids are doing burnouts? What happens is, is they're not creating any friction because they're going too fast. Without friction, you have a burnout because the car is not really going forward. But what happens is you need that friction to propel forwards. If we were to go summation of forces in the x direction, we have our frictional force and nothing else. So in order to create movement, we need that frictional force. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, what about this? Why is our wheel still going to the left if our frictional force is going to the right? Well, as you'll see, our force P, in order to create movement, it is greater than our frictional force. So our resultant force is still going to the left in both of these cases. It's one of those really, really mean things. So this is why it becomes really weird. Hopefully I cleared this up for wheels. Uh, the second one, which is of course the easier one, is going to be wedges. So the key to wedges is the frictional force on both sides must be in the same direction. Now I know you're looking at that saying, Clayton, I don't know what that means. I don't know either. Let's look at an example. So let's say that we had two boxes on top of each other. Again, this would be a very common case. And it's going to ask is what is the 
force P required to cause motion. Well, if we were to look at a free body diagram of the bottom box, we say, okay, we have a force going to the left. So we know at the bottom, our frictional force must, or I guess the force is going to the right. Our frictional force must go to the left. That's intuitive. But remember that we have that second surface on the incline also creating friction. And this is where students might go, well, I don't know which way that one goes. Well, again, the key to wedges is the frictional forces must be in the same direction. So if F1 is going to the left, well, then F2 must also go to the left. Now, this is great because if we were to analyze the, the light blue box, we know that the frictional force on that box must be equal and opposite. And this is why these friction questions become tricky. Because if I were to analyze the force P, and I'm going to bring my mouse back on screen, well, we know that we have to solve it using this free body diagram. But there's a problem because if we were to look at P, we have five unknowns. So in this type of scenario, what you typically have to do is go to this free body diagram, solve for F2 and N2. And then in this free body diagram, now that you know these two, you can then solve for P. So this is why friction gets really complex is because typically it's not just one situation, it's multiple situations. One that they love to throw at you guys is a wheel connected to a box. So of course you have to analyze the wheels movement, but then you also have to analyze the box. And remember that we said boxes can either tip or slide. So there's actually three different cases. Does the wheel move? Does the box tip? Or does the box slide? So this is why friction gets really, really gross. So this leads me to my next thing is when we have multiple objects. So this is where I'm going to give you guys probably the biggest trick of all when it comes to friction. Most of the friction questions you'll see involve multiple things. It's not just going to be a single box or a single wheel. It's going to be multiple things interlinked to each other. And again, the question will be is what is the force required to basically begin the motion? Let's say that we had this scenario where we had basically two links connected to two boxes on surfaces and we were to apply a force kind of to the middle of the link. Well, intuitively, we know that this is basically going to create three systems. We have the system in the middle where we have P, F1, and F2, and then we have two systems for our boxes which are going to have friction. If we were to look at the purple box, we know that F1 is going to try and cause horizontal movement to the left, so our frictional force is going to go to the right. If we were to look at our blue box, our force is trying to push it to the right, so our frictional force is going to the left. So it seems pretty simple where you're thinking, okay, well, all I have to do is just solve for P using that nice frictional formula. But here's the trick. If you guys want one thing from this video, please take this in mind or take this from the video. I don't know what I'm saying. It's this. It's very unlikely that the blue box and the purple box are going to slip at the same time. Remember that formula that we have, F is equal to mu times N, that is assuming our box is just on the verge of slipping. If we were to look at this scenario, if you guys were to think about real life and I were to press on things, one thing is going to slip before the other thing. So we can't use this formula on both of the boxes. We have to use it on one and then solve for the other one and vice versa. So this is what the steps would be. Uh, my personal steps. There's many different ways you can do this, but this is how I personally do it. I assume one system slips, all right? Just one, not both of them, just one. So what I said is I'm gonna pretend that F1 slips. So we know that F1 is equal to mu times N1. Basically this system on the left over here. If I now know what F1 is, well then I can solve the system using equilibrium. Remember, all the friction is using equilibrium. Sum of the forces in X, Y, and Z. Because now that I used equilibrium, I can solve for N1 as well as F1. All right, so I assume that one system slipped and I solved for all the forces in that system. Now that I know F1, I can actually use statics to determine the forces in the other system. So if I were to look at this system right here and I now know what F1 is, I can solve for P and I can solve for F2. And now that I know what F2 is, I can move on to the third system and I can solve for the frictional force F2 and N2 using only statics. That's the key here. I just solved for F2 here using only statics. I didn't use this formula. This is a big no-no. 
I solved this one using statics. All right, there's, there's the trick. Now, once we do that, we have F2 solved through with statics. And all we're going to do is we are going to compare it to our maximum friction limit of mu times N2. So again, I know what N2 is now. All I have to go is mu times N2, and then I basically get two values. If I find that my frictional force is, let's say, 10 kilonewtons, and my maximum is 20, we know that, yes, this is not going to slip. Our assumption was correct. So if F2 is less than F2 max, our assumption is correct. We're good to go. And whatever value of P we got, that, that's our value of P. That's good to go. But let's say that we solve for F2 using statics and it was 30 kilonewtons, 30. And F2 max was still 20. Well, we know that in this particular case, the box has already slipped. So in this case, our assumption was wrong. Our assumption was that the system or the purple box slipped first, but in actuality, the blue box slipped first. So now that we know that the blue box actually slipped first, we have to go back and we have to use the formula F is equal to mu times N on the blue box and then back calculate the P. So this is where it gets gross. If you make a wrong assumption of what slips first, you're going to have to start recalculating things. Now, I know a lot of you guys are saying, well, Clayton, this is dumb. What I could have done is I could have analyzed this system and then found P. And then separately, I could have analyzed this system and then found P and then just figure out which P is lower. And that is correct. Again, there's many ways of solving these things. But keep in mind that this system over here and this system over here, they were fairly independent of each other. What happens if I had a third link going between these two boxes? So now this system is connected to this system directly. So this is why it becomes really hard. And this is why I prefer my process. Again, if you guys have a way that suits you best, go for it 100%. Always do what's best for you guys. Always. I know it sounds selfish, but it's true. Always do what's best for you guys. This is why I do it in my system or in my series of steps, because it doesn't matter what's coupled to what, it'll always work. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. And with that, that is friction. So again, it sounded really bad. I always talk down on friction, but hopefully it wasn't too bad. You guys are looking at this saying, Clayton, it's not too bad. Perfect. That's what I want to hear. If I can make your guys' lives easier, that's all I want from this course or all I want from these videos. Now, I'll be real with you guys as structural engineers, and we don't use friction too much. <laughs> so if you guys are really hating this and you want to become a civil or structural engineer, uh, you don't have to worry about friction too much. If you design a building to rely on friction, well, I, I wouldn't want to be in that building. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. I can't speak for mechanical engineers, but I would assume that they use friction a lot more than us structural engineers. So it has its purposes, but if you guys want civil, you guys won't have to deal with friction too much, which is good. Now, again, I'll say this at every video. If you guys are thinking, ah, oh, this sucks, I could use some examples. Well, don't worry, I'll have some examples down below to really help get you guys familiar with friction. Again, that's all I want. I want you guys to feel comfortable with the content. So when the exam rolls around, you guys are laughing, saying, ah, Clayton had me nice and ready, or at least that's what I'm hoping for anyways. We'll have to see what happens. So yeah, that's it for this video. I wanna thank you guys all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.